someone came up with the idea of cash today, it would be immediately banned. Cash is an amazing tool for privacy, for freedom, for activism, but it's being attacked. Today, we really have two kinds of money. Public money, that's a liability of the central bank, and then money created by the banking system in the private sector. A central bank digital currency is a direct liability of a central bank, and it allows the government total control. The digital yuan is issued by the central bank, just like paper notes, tied to the Chinese government. What people don't realize is they're a massive human rights issue. All kinds of digital transactions are controlled, surveilled, monitored, blacklisted. A key difference with the CBDC is that central bank will have absolute control that will determine the use, and also we will have the technology to enforce that. There's already several hundred million people in China that are using or have exposure to these CBDCs. Digital Yuan is meant to allow the government to keep an eye on money flows. It can also be programmed, for example, to expire to encourage people to spend. There are authoritarian regimes pushing these things, and a lot of them are, are moving towards a rapid deployment phase. The CBDC tracker is a new project from the Human Rights Foundation. It stands for Central Bank Digital Currency Tracker. It's going to be an online resource that describes the progress of central bank digital currencies around the world, especially in authoritarian countries, and the civil liberties, red flags, and risks that come along with this. It'll be a resource for policymakers, journalists, the general public, and it'll be out at the end of the year. functions, different features. And I'm going to switch gears a little bit to talk about the market infrastructure and data side. So LED, what key trends have you been seeing lately around here? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll try to make it simple and to anchor this on like three different points. The first one being around the, the changes that are inherent to the new um, different requirements coming up with some of the accountant standards. I'm sure if you're in the US, you may have heard of FSIB. If you're in Europe, you may have heard of like DAC8. Um, we'll talk about MICA and, and other uh, regulations. The regulatory framework is going to change the way you operate. So we've talked a lot about policy changes and legal requirements. There is one other thing that's important to understand when you navigate the digital asset space is all of those requirements have a di direct operational impact. What we are seeing in the market as a data provider is that we're seeing a convergence towards traditional finance standards. Um, I think the previous panel was talking about MIFID, MIFIR, and others that you probably know very well in traditional finance. We are also seeing an increase in terms of reporting with DAC8 and FSAB. Now you need to report on the fair value of digital assets. Um, we're going through like a transition year in 2024 with everything you know effective in 2025. So definitely, you know, when you operate in the system, you need to have the right partners. You you need to like get more maturity in your operating systems because the way things were working before will not work 25. So increase in terms of reporting with DAC8 and FSAB. Now you you need to report on the fair value of digital assets. Um, we're going through like a transition year in 2024 with everything, you know, effective in 2025. So definitely, you know, when you operate in the system, you need to have the right partners. You'll, you need to like get more maturity in your operating systems because the way things were working before will not work anymore in different jurisdictions. Um, so we comment on that we are lucky uh, working for blockchain industry because, again, uh, we have different layers of, of um, assets. Uh, like at the bottom, we even have like mem coins, right? We can test technology using mem coins. As Victor said, there is no requirement to follow some security regulation if you work with these kind of to uh, tokens, and it's a good way to test the technology. But on the top, of course, we have securities, and uh, that's why, again, we need exchanges, um, traditional exchanges, basically, right, banks and everything. But again, we're lucky because uh, we have everything to test the technology, right? Mm -hmm. Over time, your money gets you less. Does Bitcoin? Well, in 2012, one Bitcoin bought you this much pizza. In 2016, this much pizza. In 2020, this much pizza. And in 2024, well, you get the gist. Roughly every four years, the future supply of Bitcoin is reduced. So historically, you get more, not less. So what is money and how does it get value? Paper money has value because someone says so. Bitcoin is different. It's like digital gold. It has value for many of the reasons gold does, but that's only the start. 
Gold originally had value because it was scarce, but no one knows how much is left to dig up. Bitcoin, on the other hand, has a limited supply, 21 million, and it can never be counterfeited. Every day, more people are buying it, making it more scarce, making it more valuable. But you can also split it up because every Bitcoin is divisible by a lot. Each Bitcoin can be split into 100 million smaller units. So if one Bitcoin was worth $1 million, the smallest unit, called a Satoshi, would be worth one penny. So you can send whatever amount you want, and no one can stop you, because no central authority controls it. So unlike with banks and credit card companies, you don't need approval to use it, and no one can decide to just print more or shut it down. It puts the power back in all our hands. Bitcoin lets you control your finances. Kraken lets you buy Bitcoin. Kraken. See what crypto can be.